speaker this evening, but Terry Hightower, he and his wife Vicki have two children and four grandchildren. He preaches for the congregation in Vega, Texas. He has authored uh, several books and debated. He is a very well talented individual. I thought uh, when you pick up the telephone and you hear on the other end that it's Terry Hightower, what do you want to do? Everybody knows. And so the subject I gave him was that. <laughs> now some people thought that uh, this was a key to him to do it. Now, I wouldn't dispute any of that. You know, I'm an agreeable person. So, I didn't really actually, uh, I got a couple of telephone calls uh, in as I was preparing for the theme and the lessons, and one of them asked, and it, uh, don't know who the person was. I just called here, and uh, probably most of you preachers have gotten a call along these lines. Uh, but asking, do you teach that uh, if you commit suicide, that it's a direct ticket to hell? And so you try and talk to the person a while, but uh, then the same week got in talking to someone else. Uh, they contemplated suicide. It is a major problem in our society, especially with young people. And we need to know how to deal with it from a biblical perspective. And Brother Terry did a great job in his lesson uh, in the book, and so looking forward to what he's going to have to say this evening. I got my assignment from uh, Michael by email, and then about four days later, a mysterious little package uh, came marked, uh, postmarked from Pensacola. That's all it said, uh, and it was in a priority mail thing, so I got it within four days of getting the email assignment, and it had this little bottle of sleeping tablets in it. <laughs> And it had a note, the only thing it said, the little note said, in big letters and in red, it said, hint, hint. And I don't, I don't know, I'm not very good at deduction. So, in fact, I, I would first have to induce, and then I'd have to deduce, and I got lost uh, in all of that. So I don't know who that was for sure. We can't really pin it, I guess, on Michael. It was one of you brethren here at Pensacola, I'm sure of that, though. I was recently in California for a seminar on logic and the Bible uh, for at least five sessions. And this is where Johnny Oxendine uh, preaches there at San Mateo. Well, they allege he preaches there. Uh, but his wife Pam says that we have created a monster with this logic and the Bible seminar and me coming out there. And I've had to try to keep her calm. She said, Terry, how would you like to get up every single, single solitary Sunday morning to the same old question week after week. Honey, does this tie go with the syllogism in my sermon? <laughs> Johnny's son Drew tells me that everything must now be set up in syllogistic form. You know, A implies B. A is true is the minor premise. And therefore, you know, uh, B then is true. And I said to Pam, I said, so what's wrong with that? And, and uh, Drew said, and he explained it to me here since he's been here, he said they recently went as a family up the coastline to go to one of the state parks to go camping. He said he needed a restroom break real bad. He was in the back seat. But he said that by the time he got his argument into proper form for Johnny with a major and minor premise that he had already reached his conclusion. <laughs> And I did want to, just want one more word along this line, and that is, Bob, well, your lesson this morning, or rather for Tuesday morning, tomorrow morning on gossip, 
I've looked it over, I've read over it, and it, it looks great, uh, Rolf, which is unusual for you. Uh, but, you know, could you, I'm, I'm begging you practically, I'm tr entreating and I'm begging, kind of like Paul did in various places, that you arrange to teach that material on gossip to Johnny. Uh, Johnny Oxidine, because I phoned out to San Mateo to his office one day, and a recorded message came on, and it said, Johnny's not in right now, but would you care to leave a rumor? <laughs> so, enough, I guess, enough of that. I don't know why people pick on me. I never, you know, say anything out of line, but I better watch this roof here and probably come in on me. They were, they were a happy married couple in their late 40s, and they had two fine children and an expensive new home. Everybody liked them. They even had a large hobby farm, they called it, with a number of horses. And they seemed to be a modern day, what we would look at as a modern day success. And then one day, the wife lost her job, though, due to corporation downsizing and ignoring all that she still had, ignoring all of that, uh, one warm sunny morning she went out and hanged herself in the horse barn. Uh, did her death, ask yourself, did her death solve anything really? No, absolutely not. It only caused, don't you see, more tragedy. First here on earth to her family, and then secondly, very likely to herself in the afterlife. The, the husband, after grieving for his wife for nearly a year, he went to the local funeral home uh, to make pre-arrangements for his own funeral, as so many people do in our day and time. After he filled out all the papers and he gave a check of full payment to the unsuspecting funeral uh, director, he went outside, he took out a 12-gauge shotgun from his car, and he killed himself in the funeral home parking lot. Did his death solve anything? No, absolutely not. The couple's two children, a son and a daughter, and I relate to this because I have a son and a daughter, uh, in their early and mid-twenties, of course, are now left uh, without either of their parents and left with the terrible knowledge and the memory of what happened to them. And we can only hope and pray that such tragic events for this family have now uh, ended. The taking of one's life by an accountable person does not, his, of your own life by an accountable person, does not solve anything. It just creates more misery uh, here on earth, and more importantly, and very likely for sure, if you're accountable, in the afterlife. You know, in the interim torments of Luke 16, and, and then finally in Gehenna or hell itself. Even popular health-related suicides must first be proven to be ethically correct. And of course, to do that, you're going to need this. And it's been already mentioned several times, and I'm sure we'll be further in uh, our studies this week. But it must be proven ethically correct from a higher source than mere uninspired men. Uh, those who would defend such killings which derive from mere non-Christian uh, philosophies, non-biblical philosophies uh, of men like Derek Hunt, uh, Humphrey of the Hemlock Society who assisted, get this, he assisted in his own wife's self-murder. Uh, uh, or the late, and it, it, was, it wasn't late, I couldn't have said that when I first wrote this, but the late Jack Kevorkian with his patented suicide machine it doesn't have a marvelous name. It's called the Mercitron. Mercitron. I thought of that in hearing the lesson about songs and so forth and how they affect people. Yes, and even putting a label or titling thing sometimes also because it's a mercy killing, you see, an assisted suicide. Uh, well, they're under obligation to use the divine word of God as their necessary proof. I often thought, what would I do if I bumped into Jack Kevorkian somewhere? And I think I'd do this. I'd say, oh, Jack Kevorkian, we'd be relieved with all our heart and soul if on the night you were conceived, your folks had known of birth control. That's what I'd say to him. Uh, the man uh, was responsible, as you know, for at least 130 people 
that he personally assisted, plus all of the materials and everything that he disseminated and even had when they finally got him after turning him loose so many times, they finally got him because he actually went on television there and showed and did an assisted suicide right there, and they filmed it. And so they had obvious proof right there as to what happened, the details of it anyway. Well, human liberty is not a license to do what I want. Let me say that again. It's very simple, but think about it. And this is one of the things that distinguishes us, those of us who believe in God and believe in Christ and the Bible. Human liberty is not a license to do uh, what I want, but rather it's my freedom to live within what God's law here requires of me as instruction which is in what? Righteousness. 2 Timothy 3, verse 17. From the one who is absolute and who is objective uh, about uh, any sort of thing you know, to do uh, with uh, right or wrong. Well, uh, there, although there is such a thing, I would say, uh, as uh, benevolent suicide, I believe that not only Samson is what we could call a benevolent suicide, and you must be very precise in your definitions, and God requires us to do this, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. And yet, also I'd add in, I believe Jonah was really involved in that. You can read that later uh, in the material. But, you know, there is such a thing as benevolent suicide when one forfeits his own life in order to save or attempt to save others. Uh, The common suicide is a clear violation, though, of the sanctity of life and a horrible personal tragedy which should never, ever happen. It's truly heartbreaking for humans to dispose of the life that they have been gifted by God uh, because of life's misfortunes, which leads them to a lot of words for it. Dis- I was despondent, I was depressed, or I was humiliated, uh, and any of the other hundreds of other so called reasons given to justify this act of self murder or self killing. What exactly uh, is solved by some of these uh, things? Well, I'll, I'll list several things uh, where. Uh, we know uh, certain suicides. I don't have time to even start to go into anything uh, like you know uh, all of them. Uh, but I, I do remember uh, at the congregation in Vega where I presently preach. Uh, again, what's exactly solved by a suicide? And this was the adult son of one of our uh, members at Vega, and, and he was a long time unfaithful member of Christ church who was once again back living with his mother who is a faithful Christian. This man was in his uh, 40s, later 40s uh, at least. And she told me everything seemed fine that morning when he left for work. He had a good job in Amarillo. But he simply drove himself that morning over to a nearby town. He parked his small pickup truck and he used a pistol to blast himself into eternity unprepared, if I'm any judge of it, unprepared from the Bible uh, part of it, unprepared to meet his God. You know, here, listen to this. Are you listening? Those of you who are listening out here uh, and watching it perhaps on the internet also, I hope you listen to this very carefully. It is my understanding that this, uh, this man, this son, ultimately separated himself from the Lord's church over the fact that of the men refusing to allow his sister to use instrumental music in her wedding ceremony. Is that, is that sufficient, do you think? Or was his faith you know, in Christ or in something like that and the right to do it? Does he not recognize biblical authority? I don't believe that they had elders at the time. They might have. Vega has held elders in the past. But regardless, the men or the elders, uh, what about that? Are you going to lose your soul over something that that trivial? I, I hope not. Uh, I attended undergraduate graduate school with a fellow gospel preacher, and he was a personal friend uh, whom I had known at the previous uh, college. But he was finally overcome, and we've had a lesson on that, a good lesson on that, overcome by pornography to the point that he had to give up uh, getting his uh, M.A., 
In fact, I'd give up preaching altogether. Uh, he's, and from what I believe was personal sin and unfulfilled accomplishments in secular life and in the church, a few years later, he had moved off and back to New York. And then his first name was Bob. And he moved back uh, to Memphis. Uh, and I was up there, I think, for one of the lectureships and happened to you know, uh, talk with him and so forth. Uh, but then he goes back home. He's told me he was glad that I was doing what I you know, enjoyed doing, and teaching and so forth and preaching. Uh, but you know, Bob overdosed on two prescription uh, uh, with two prescription bottles of, of mood brighteners, as they're called. And those are very dangerous, and you better know what you're doing when you get in some of that. I'm not saying they're wrong to take. I think some people, you know, uh, perhaps uh, really need it. Uh, certain ones really need it, but I think they go overboard. But this was about 10 years uh, uh, later from when he had been at the graduate school. And what uh, was so interesting and, and tragic in one sense. He, uh, Bob wrote notes uh, to both his son and his daughter. They only had two children. And he rolled those up and put them in the mood brightener prescri prescription bottles and he hid them under some clothes in the chest of drawers in the house and no note to his wife. What do you think she felt? No parting farewell to his wife at all. Can you imagine how his wife Arlene felt about that? Well, Mark, my childhood friend, who was a non-Christian, he used a gun to blow himself away at age 21 in Tampa, Florida uh, over what they said were concerns regarding a, a breakup or something with a girlfriend. A lot of times you trace it back to things like that. like that, And regret also over his soldiering, being a soldier in Vietnam. One lady I baptized down in Zephyr Hills, Florida, before we moved back to Texas in 2003. Uh, I baptized her in 2003. I had to cope with not only the loss of her daughter to suicide, but then about two years later, she was faced with that daughter's teenage son following suit uh, by also hanging himself. It's called a copycat, you see, suicide. You know, some of these happen at some of these high schools. And hey, where's the stopping place with it? Uh, and there are reasons, and I hope if you don't, we don't, aren't going to get anything maybe about half of my material, but I hope you will go through and read some of the things I perhaps will not uh, get to so that we start doing more of what we ought to be doing in order to quell, to stop, or at least slow down these types of things. Uh, no, apparently due to a personal failure experience in losing his job, Another otherwise outstanding, outstanding Christian brother whom I'd known in Florida, he'd moved to another state, and a fellow soldier of the cross uh, took his own life, leaving his wife and his two children to fend for themselves. Over a job loss was the primary uh, motivation there. And by this time, as I said, they had moved to a, another state, so it was not possible for me. Uh, you know, I was not close by in order to help this bewildered widow, Christian widow, uh, or kids. Another gospel preacher, a uh, fellow gospel preacher, uh, whom I had known in Florida, but he had moved to Nashville long, be long before this. He parked his truck in the church parking lot in Nashville, Tennessee, in the church parking lot, and he used a pistol to murder himself. And you know why? It was all brought on by his just then, right before that, finding out that his elders, it was a large, good-sized congregation in Nashville, that his elders and his wife were now aware of his adultery. You know, most of us give many, I'm sure you give many more uh, examples of this tragedy, both in, involving both Christians and non-Christians. And all of us know of attempted suicides, which are sometimes called para para suicides. Well, you can read the statistics, but it's simply incredible. Uh, in that, according to worldwide recent worldwide statistics, each year roughly one million people kill themselves by intentionally committing suicide, uh, averaging out to one suicide every 40 seconds. And significantly, and I had not read this. Uh, the number is higher than those who are murdered or killed in combat. And moreover, it's estimated that unsuccessful suicide attempts are up to 20 times more frequent than completed suicides. 
20 times attempted more than the ones that actually commit suicide. And around the world, suicide is among the top three causes of death among people ages 15 to 44. And even in the United States, the number of suicides, which were over 32,000 in the year 2005, is nearly double that of homicides or murders, which is only around 18-something thousand, I think, in 2005. 32,000 in 2005. And it's continuing. It's not really slowing down as far as I can tell. Well, you can read some of the other statistics. I'm not going to take uh, time uh, uh, with a lot of that. I hope that you will read it. Uh, suicide was a word coined by a man of the name of Walter Charlton in, in uh, uh, 1651. His claim was that to vindicate oneself from extreme and otherwise inevitable calamity by suicide, that's his hyphenation, suicide, he said, is not a crime. Uh, this hyphenated word is not one Latin word, rather it links two Latin words, sua, which means self, and side, which means to kill. Uh, well, John Dunn, uh, in a, a famous writing of his, uh, he came up with this thing, another, uh, his proposed self-homicide, as a, a more mild, a milder, more mild type or neutral term, but actually uh, Walter Charlton's uh, the word suicide, suicide, uh, again, a self uh, kill uh, carried the day. Uh, and, and instead of some of the other words that some you know tried uh, to do, but remember this: that taking the taking of one's own life is a violation of the sixth commandment given by God. We realize we're not under that except by principle today. It has been basically the principle reaffirmed, of course, under the New Covenant, of course. Uh, but it's, it's, like the, it's the, like the term euthanasia, like suicide, is also made up of two parts. And in this case, uh, it's a couple of words which mean Greek uh, words put together, which means good or easy death, euthanasia. The you meaning good or easy and thanatos meaning death. And however, what you want to see here is from an objective outside source and not mere human philosophies uh, is that from a Christian standpoint, from the Bible viewpoint of it, uh, what is promoted under this term is neither either euthanasia or suicide. It's neither, especially euthanasia. It's not good or easy. Uh, thus, suicide is the taking of one's own life and are causing it to be taken by another, inclusive of any motive, circumstance, or method uh, used. And so I hope you'll study uh, uh, in the book, in the, the, all the biblical counts, uh, accounts of suicide that uh, I have studied through and examined each one of those, and I hope you will do that with your Bible in hand, or suicides, or also attempted suicides that are recorded in the Bible. You know, and I'm sure that's not there for cannon fodder, is it? It's there for a reason for us to see and to look and introspect about ourselves. You know, someone well said years ago to me, and I remember writing it in my Bible at first, but I've remembered it, and that is the fact that uh, we not only read God's Word, the Bible, but the Bible reads us. And you know what he meant by that? If you study your Bible, you know what he meant by that? You see yourself in these examples. Many times, of course, negative examples. You see yourself. Hopefully you see yourself in some of the positive ones found in both the Old and the New Testament. But from the perspective of the Judeo-Christian tradition, suicide, which it would include euthanasia, violates the principle involved in the commandment you shall not murder. That's the New King James rendering, of course, of Exodus 20 and verse 13. Also read Deuteronomy 5 and verse 17. And though some have foolishly attempted to argue that contextually that verse applies only to persons other than oneself. I have a good number of materials that actually argue that. It's only killing somebody else, not yourself. doesn't include that. Uh, uh, we can easily see the error of that by studying other Bible verses. Remember, the sum of thy word is true, Psalm 119, 160, especially in the American Standard Version. Uh, and these include, Thou shalt love thy neighbor, how? As thyself. 
How, much, how can you make it any plainer in God's Word than that? That's Leviticus 19.18. You can also study Matthew 5.43, Matthew 19.19, 19, uh, Romans 13, 13 verses 8-10. through 10. The right to harm self and neighbor stand or fall together, don't you see? And if you have the right to illicitly harm yourself, then you have the right to similarly harm your neighbor. If you have the right to kill yourself because you think your life is not worth living, then loving your neighbor as yourself uh, would mean that you may kill your neighbor if his life is deemed by you in your own little subjective world uh, as not worth living. And suicide hardly displays uh, self-love in God's biblical presentation or viewpoint of it. Human life is sacred as you well know because God made man his own image and likeness. Genesis 1, 26-28. Genesis 9 and verse 6, which is dealing with more of a legal situation where someone is being, of course, punished who has killed illicitly, and therefore his blood, of course, must be shed by men's uh, hands. And yet, this is said in contradistinction. What you must see here, the Bible uh, is here, and it says one thing, but uh, this is contrary to the utilitarian attitude of humans. And where, oh, where did they get their attitude? I was just talking recently, just a, uh, in fact, it was yesterday, with uh, someone, uh, someone who's pretty close to me, uh, and who has left the church, is off in their own little hedonistic uh, narcissism and so forth world. Uh, and we were discussing, I believe it's due, something to do with uh, homosexuality. And I asked them, you know, uh, something about that because they had made some comments about it over what we were discussing. And I just remember looking at them and saying, and you want to remember to do this with people. Paul teaches it in the uh, book of Romans and it's taught by Christ and his actions with people. But I just asked them the pointed uh, question. I said, and they're strongly arguing this point which is opposite of mine. In other words, they're holding X is true to do with homosexuality is like leave people alone and so forth, let the kid grow up, he can decide what he's going to be, male or female. Also, you've seen this recent case where the couple's not uh, going to let anybody know whether it's a boy or a girl that they have and they're already here and their hair is uh, so linked that you can't tell uh, unless you change the diaper, you don't know whether they are male or female. And they don't want anybody to know that. And I had, yeah, later asked them about that. I said, would you let your child grow up this way? Well, I knew the answer already to that one was no. But back to the original situation, I said, the deal with you is, uh, see, I have this, and I'm going to be judged by it, and you are, and everybody is. This is over me. I said, but next week, or next month, or next year, you have the beauty, uh, if you want to look at it that way, of switching your view and coming over with me about it, and then maybe a month or a year later, they can switch back. Who's to say? Because nobody can come down on it if you don't believe in objective truth. Absolute objective truth. That's what subjectivism is all about. <clears throat> and yet the Bible does not, certainly does not affirm that. There is one God, and He teaches in His Word only one thing about certain major uh, uh, principles and by principle and specifics about these matters that are being discussed uh, this week. Oh yes, we admit there's some uh, Bible questions like, you know, why did Nicodemus come to Jesus by night? That we'll never figure that one and decide it to any sort of unanimous situation. But that doesn't matter to my soul as far as I can tell unless you can show me that it does. But these things that are being discussed uh, yesterday and today, uh, folks, they, they do count. We'll be discussed Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. They're soul matters. They're things that, that, <clears throat> that really do uh, count. Well, again, why, why do people commit uh, you know, suicide? But before I go into that, just remember 1 John 3 and verse 15. Uh, it makes clear there, John does, in 1 John 3 and verse 15, you might look at it, uh, that no murderer has eternal life. And I make some allowances for certain things when people, yes, are mentally off. I have that in the material. I, I understand that. 
But a lot of people, I believe, and especially as restudying a lot of this, they are hiding, they are ethically hiding themselves behind verses which do not actually apply, you know, to them. Uh, like I, I was off my rocker when I'm doing this, and God's going to let this go. Will He? Uh, tell me, where's Judas right now? Where's his soul or spirit? And and several, uh, some others, of course, you uh, would be reading about. Well, why suicide? Some main so-called reasons, at least, for committing suicide include depression, schizophrenia, uh, and other mental uh, illness. Now again, here's what I would say about it. Perhaps if we could know absolutely in a certain particular case, you know, that a suicide was due solely to a person being mentally off to the extent that they were not accountable. And I've given you verses, I'm not going to take time to deal with it tonight, but I'll give you four or five, six verses there. We would be better able to cope with this suicide thing. When the mother asked me to speak at the graveside service for her son that had killed himself there, uh, as I described a moment ago, I thought, what am I going to say? And some of you have written in the last four or five years and, and, uh, and asked about that. What, what do you say at a, <coughs> at a funeral? Believe me, a little baby's a whole lot easier, isn't it, <laughs> than that? Unless you're a Calvinist. Uh, well, some of our brethren are going into that. That's why I mentioned that. But the fact is, it's, an ex it's extremely difficult to isolate uh, these so-called reasons of the mental situation. It's extremely difficult to isolate from other related free will uh, actions by accountable souls. Some persons have difficulty dealing with life, especially if, if, involved, if they're involved with alcohol uh, or other drugs, uh, devastating money matters or personal social relationships like the loss of a spouse through divorce or the loss of a boyfriend or girlfriend uh, or like a, a, the grandson I mentioned above who lost his mother, you know, and so he ends up killing himself. And the woman I had baptized, uh, of course, lost both of them, her daughter and her grandson, uh, hanging themselves. Well, some kill themselves out of bereavement over a loved one, uh, dying when they feel they just cannot carry on any longer without them. But today we have all read of cases of bullying, either in person or over the internet, where apparently some immature, insecure, frightened, or embarrassed individuals, it leads them to self-killing. But it shouldn't. But one of the main things is because we are not teaching these kids do not believe what happens five minutes after death, according to Luke 16. I remember getting set straight on that one myself. I thought as a young person, say 10, 11, 12 years old, I thought I soul slept. Most of you know what that means. Go in here and you're in the grave, didn't feel any pain. After all, in the resurrection, that great day of John 5, 28, 29, curse, Terry comes forth from the grave. My soul reunites with my body. And, and he'll probably, since I was just a young person, he'll, and, you know, he'll just go, come on in, Terry. Come on in to heaven. Then I heard the preacher preach, and you know, you need to do this at least once or twice a year, preach a sermon, and like uh, uh, certain brethren uh, said about our rights. You remember what they said? He preached in technicolor. Well, preach Luke 16 in technicolor. And they, this preacher did that. He was not a dynamic speaker at all. Uh, but I listened, I had my Bible open, I read along with him, and I said, hey, uh, wait a minute. We're not soul sleeping after death five minutes later. Or you could say five seconds, couldn't you? You're going to be in one place or the other. I, mean, I wonder why Jesus said more about hell and then some of the Luke 16, the interim situation there, of either lifting up your eyes with a rich man in torments, or, and there's no middle ground here. There's no middle ground between truth and error about this. You're over here then in, with, uh, in Abraham's bosom, or what most of us conclude, of course, the same thing as Jesus talking to the one thief and saying, Today thou shalt be with me where? In paradise. Well, we better go back and, you know, you can't go this route uh, of PETA, you know, and the quality of people with ethical treatment of animals to the quality of all species, you know, because after all, they may say, after all, they shoot horses, don't they? And say, so, <laughs> 
Well, I, I can't go on. I'm going to end it all. But it's not the end. Because you continue, we will continue to exist and must answer ethically to God in eternity. According to verses like 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. Matthew 10, 28. Whereas a horse, folks, does neither. Well, so don't say either, at least not in my presence anymore. I broke myself of it years ago. Someone dies and they're either an unfaithful Christian, and you really know that they are, as far as you can tell from you know, the basic uh, uh, things that are involved with that person, or they're a person who is of accountable age, but they haven't been baptized, immersed into Christ, and, and yet they had some illness or they had some lingering thing from a car wreck or whatever, and you say, well, they're out of their pain now. Are they? Luke 16? I'm telling you. Preach it in technicolor on Luke 16, and the person who's rational, which I was, that, that got me, Michael. Uh, I was baptized right after that. That's, there's a certain little motivation God has built into His Word, and that's what it's all about, isn't it? You remember what that man said? Oh, Father, he cried and said, Father Abraham, Luke 16, verse uh, 24. Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. Watch this. For I am in anguish in this flame. I don't propose to be able to explain that, what the flame is to you. Especially one later on spoken of being cast into outer darkness. Most any kind of flame. I don't know anything about how some kind of light to it. But uh, I know one thing. God means it. And he tells us he's going to be in anguish in this flame and I don't want to go. And I'm certainly not going to kill myself even if I have some debilitating disease or illness and so forth. Some of this you'll read in the material. It's, it's just the fact that you do not have a right uh, to suicide. One of the central features, and I'll close with this, but you have to hear this, and that is... Uh, the one essential feature that characterizes all types of depression is this. Get this, gospel preachers, of what our job is about. Is the feeling of hopelessness and helplessness. But guess what? The gospel message is what? We're never without hope. A Christian is never without hope in Christ. Uh, suicide, the ones who commit suicide are persons who do not attend church. you know this? Persons who do not attend church are four times more likely to commit suicide than our frequent church attenders. In fact, the lack of church attendance correlates more strongly with suicide rates than with any other risk factor, including unemployment. It should be noted that believers who fail to act consistently with their faith, like I believe the individual at Vega that killed himself while he was living in his mother's home, uh, will surely forfeit any advantages when you fail to act consistently. In other words, to walk in the light as He is in the light. You'll forfeit any advantages to yourself uh, uh, which your church attendance, uh, if you're just punching your clock as we call it, might otherwise procure. We must be consistent like James 1, 5-8 through 8 says in walking the talk as we call it. And I, as we tried to show in the material, that these Bible suicides or attempted Bible suicides back this up. This is not our Bible, folks. This is the Humanist Manifestos 1 and 2. That's not your Bible. Some people are trying to get answers which they might as well be looking in here. I've come to using this off and on. That's if I speak with younger. That's a Cracker Jack box. You can open it up. And, and there's a message inside. You may even, you know, you might win something even bigger if you go through all the steps they make you go to try to get it. Uh, but hey, where'd you get your answer? Ask these people. Ask a humanist. Look him in the eye. I don't care if he's a college professor. Ask him, where did you learn this? Where did you find out what you hold? That there's no punishment after this life is over. Prove it. Give me the argument which proves that conclusion. And then you see, uh, then this will make you appreciate what we got here. And there's basically your, really your two choices. You can take men's philosophy that Paul condemned in Colossians 2 and verse 8, and you might as well get a lot of it. Oh, it sounds sophisticated. I've been in those classes over and over again. I'm going to go now and sit in on them. Uh, but partially just to sit there and be able to ask the right pointed question 
at the right time and help our Christian young people out to see through all of this stuff. Well, uh, as usual, I'm out of time. We have a section about military uh, uh, suicides. Read that. Read that material. And it's shocking, the military suicides and what's going on there. And, and I've tried to give you some great quotes from people who are involved with these people uh, as to why, as to why they end up killing themselves. And I'll end with this. In the Netherlands, physicians have at times performed involuntary euthanasia because they thought the family had suffered too much or were tired of taking care of patients. American surgeon Robin Bernhoff relates an incident in which a Dutch doctor euthanized a 26-year-old ballerina with arthritis in her toes. Since she could no longer pursue her career as a dancer, she was depressed and requested to be put to death. And the doctor complied with her request and merely noted this, quote, that one doesn't enjoy such things, but it was her choice. No, it wasn't. Hey, read the passages, folks, about we belong to God. And you never, as a Christian, of course, should lose uh, hope. Read those accounts of Judas and Samson and Jonah and their ones either attempted suicides or real suicides. And I think it will help you to see what we have in God's Word. If you'll study and meditate on it and think about it, and, and you'll see various things that are sort of headed off at the pass, if you will, to keep you out of a Cracker Jack philosophy mentality and keep you on target with the Scriptures. I hope you'll do that.